Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the Public Improvement Commission hearing of July 11, 2019. Our first item are the hearing minutes. At the request of the Public Improvement Commission staff, the acceptance of the minutes of the PIC hearing held on June 20th, 2019. Any questions or comments on the hearing minutes? I'll entertain a motion on this item. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from last week's uh, June 20th hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Moving on to our public hearing, our first item is a joint petition uh, by the City of Boston Transportation Department, the City of Boston Public Works Department, and Goodwill Headquarters, Inc. for the widening and relocation of the existing right-of-way lines of Melanie Cass Boulevard, the public way in Roxbury, located on the southwesterly side between Harrison Avenue and Albany Street. This was new business on June 20th, 2019, and this is as shown on a plan entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division Widening and Relocation Plan at Melanie Cass Boulevard, Melanie Cass Boulevard Reconstruction, Roxbury, one sheet dated. May 29th, 2019. Good morning, Chief and Commissioners. Um, I'm Todd Hoey with Boston Transportation Department, uh, Senior Planner and Project Manager for the Melnia Cass Boulevard Reconstruction Project. Um, uh, as you said, uh, Chief and Commissioner, we're here uh, back today uh, for our hearing um, relative to the widening and relocation areas, as well as the specific repair plans for uh, the entire, entire corridor. Um, the widening and relocation uh, areas, um, three different roadways, Columbus Ave, Melnick Cass Boulevard itself, and uh, Albany Street. and. Um, we're not widening the roadway, it's widening uh, the areas, um, the streetscape areas to accommodate handicap accessibility, um, pedestrian accommodation, and um, protected intersections, bike accommodation. Um, so we needed that extra space uh, from the city layout and city right away. Um, for specific repair uh, for the entire corridor, um, relative to major improvements in reconstruction involving um, full build reconstruction of the roadway surface, um, sidewalks, uh, grade separated cycle track, um, new stormwater systems, stormwater recharge, um, new street lighting systems and street lights, new traffic signals, traffic signal control boxes and uh, um, related traffic signal equipment, fiber optic, uh, for traffic management, um, raised intersections in some particular locations, um, one in particular at the Tremont um, right turn, which will be signalized and have its profile raised for additional uh, ped safety. We have a raised uh, approach from Sajuna uh, Truth Way uh, slash Care Way um, for approaches to Melnia. We have a slightly raised profile at uh, Washington and Melnia, about three inch above grade. Same with Albany Street near the uh, Orchard Garden School. Um, the intent to um, slow traffic. Um, the traffic calming measures were called out in our process with community engagement as well as city agencies that um, traffic calming and slowing down of vehicles was paramount. So we wanted to try these kind of cutting edge uh, treatments. So um, the raised uh, elements were incorporated into the plans. Um, just real quick on the history, we had uh, a design that would have actually widened the roadway uh, originally incorporating um, center median busway. And um, during the uh, process of um, the design and community uh, engagement, um, we actually had to um, scrap that idea and um, go back to the drawing board and create uh, more of a design that uh, was amenable to the neighborhood, um, more of a complete streets design and um, something that wouldn't intrude upon the uh, edge of the roadway and the residential communities and some of the new, the new development that's um, starting to um, be built along the corridor. So we changed course on this um, several years ago. Uh, we received full funding in 2016 to the federal uh, earmark money to the tune of $25 million. And uh, what we've done um, with that opportunity is um, create a roadway that will be safer, um, greener. We're planting over 250 trees. 
yes, we do have to re re uh, remove uh, a number of trees, but we will be planting a significant amount, um, three or four times of, of what we're removing. Um, so with that, I just want to hand it over to our design team to maybe walk through um, the elements of the project, the um, widening, relocation, the specific repair, and uh, the improvements as part of the project. Thanks, Pat. Um, oh, sorry. sorry, Rich Latini with uh, House and Hudson, Mark Graviglisi, House and Hudson, and uh, Mark DiGiacomo from uh, House and Hudson. Thank you, uh, Thank you for the brief summary. Now I don't have to give it. But, uh, I'll go right to the widening as the first item on the agenda. So, I just need to see this. So, from Melody Cast Boulevard, I'm going to take about an eight foot wide strip along the uh, southern edge. This is to accommodate a bike, a one way cycle track easterly that doesn't exist today. So, the cycle track will actually be where today's sidewalk is, and this will be in the, the widening will actually contain a new cement concrete sidewalk. Uh, this is half. A little bit more than half, about 2,200 square feet, is on Goodwill's property. And the other half is on city property, which is adjacent to the uh, service parking lot for the Orchard Garden staff. Both these areas are uh, uh, landscape areas, uh, mulch and Goodwill and grass. So uh, basically, when we take this widening, it doesn't really affect the operations of anything else. So with that, I'll take questions. That's the simple one. So, for sure. Questions on the widening area location? Stretch. Goodwill is obviously a co-petitioner. Are they here today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have a letter. Yes, Pat's got every signature that you could imagine for this carter. Yes. Good. Other questions or comments on the widening relocation? All right. I'll entertain a motion on this item. Make a motion to approve the joint petition by the City of Boston Transportation Department, the City of Boston Public Works Department, and give goodwill headquarters for the widening relocation of the existing right of way lines of Melnia Cass Boulevard is written to the record by the chair. Has shown a set of plans entitled City of Boston Public Works Department, Engineering Division Widening Relocation Plan, Melnia Cass Boulevard, Melnia Cass Boulevard Reconstruction, Roxbury One Sheet dated May 29, 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Moving on to our next item on a joint petition by the City of Boston Transportation Department and Northeastern University for the widening and relocation of the existing right of way lines of Columbus Avenue and Public Way in Roxbury, located on its northwesterly side, generally at Melnia Cass Boulevard. Uh, this was new business on June 20th, 2019, and this is shown on a plan entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division Widening and Relocation Plan, Columbus Avenue, Melanie Cass Boulevard, Reconstruction, Roxbury, one sheet dated May 29th, 2019. Uh, this is uh, some widings that we were asking for from Northeastern University um, for parts of the project. Uh, for parts of the project uh, for one is a Sidewalk here that exists today. We're just giving them the easement highway in far that inside the project limits. The other widening in the far is it's kind of a continuation of the uh, Southwest Car of Bikeway. It's already there today. We're at anything that's in the project area, uh, Mass DT access to the easement. So that's a piece of the reason for these two uh, widening requests. And you know these, that did sign the competition. We did quite a bit, but they're not here today. Yeah, this is just for the record. This needs to be on the record. That's okay. Yep. This roughly lines up with the, the bike infrastructure which was put in place last year uh, yeah. on Columbus Ave. We've been coordinating with our active transportation director to make sure the um, bike facilities match up. Great. Right. Other questions or comments on this one? Any other question? Uh, Amir Todd? Yeah. Members of the public? Uh, Please. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, and uh, my name is Allison Pultonis. I'm uh, affiliated with the Friends of Melnia Cass Boulevard, and um, I'm just briefly going to address this vote, uh, but I will have comments on some of the other. Yep. And um, just related to these widenings, um, the curb line is getting moved on the north side of the boulevard, but because that is the um, existing 40-foot transportation easement, um, you're not voting on that widening aspect, I'm assuming. Um, however, there are left turn lanes being added um, at um, uh, Albany heading north and uh, a left turn approaching on the boulevard approaching Shawmut southbound. So the um, 
comment made that the road is actually not getting widened doesn't seem quite accurate. I do want to correct that. Thank you. Something that may be related to the specific repairs, which we'll get into, but uh, which I appreciate, Allison. Is there, uh, can you just respond to that about whether we're actually changing the ultimate curb lines along Melnia, Melnia Cass when we add those two left turn lanes? So, Mark Gravelisi, Howard Stein Hudson, uh, at times there is an additional lane added to the roadway for the left turn lanes. However, there are existing medians at certain locations that we're maximizing that space, turning it into roadway. We're doing our best to keep the crossings and the roadway widths from curb to curb as short as possible for pedestrian safety. Uh, and the protected intersections do uh, alleviate some of those extended crossings as well. The pedestrians get a lead time out into a protected space before crossing the road. Uh, we, we did not create additional through lanes in, and to increase capacity. This was not an operations project. It was a safety project. So we did our best to keep the roadway width as, uh, and the lane allocations as the same as they are today. And that's an that's a important piece of information. The pedestrian safety piece of this, that's why those protected uh, turn lanes are. It's a 101 Vision Zero implementation, one of our toolbox things that make it safer for pedestrians in that area. So I appreciate that response. Okay. Uh, my name is Ken Krukemeyer. I'm another member of the Friends of Melanie Kess. Um, with respect to pedestrian safety and crossings, uh, I would like to correct the record that the dimensions are being made shorter for the pedestrians. And to that effect, uh, it's important for you to take a look at drawings that we have done in analyzing the PIC drawings. Um, and this particular uh, submittal here you will show you that the dimensions for the pedestrian crossing from sidewalk to sidewalk has been increased extraordinarily from typically a little over 50, 54 feet or so uh, from sidewalk to sidewalk to in many cases 82 to 88 feet to get from sidewalk to sidewalk. So the pedestrian from raised sidewalk that is in yellow in those drawings will go down to the level of the street at the, at the bikeway, will then cross over to a space in the median, will then cross over the roadway itself, will into another space between the median, and then cross the bikeway before they can go up to the sidewalk on the other side. So it's the belief of many people in the neighborhood that this is much more punitive to the pedestrian trying to get from one side of Melnia Cast to the other rather than a benefit to the pedestrian. And so from a complete stra sta streets standpoint, this is really in opposition to what the complete streets stands for, which is improving things. One of the basic commitments made by the city when the project started was to try to improve the connection from one side of Lower Roxbury to the other. And to add to the problems of this going down, across, and back up much longer distances, these traffic signals also should be encouraging. And where the city had originally told the neighborhood that they would have automatic walks so that they could get across from one side of Lower Roxbury to the other, they were told at the last meeting at 75 percent that people would have to come and push a button and wait for the cycle to come through before they'd be given the opportunity to walk, that there would be no automatic walks and that it would be uh, only at request of the pedestrian. The neighborhood is extremely unhappy about that and believes that they have been uh, misled in this project. Thank you. So, sir, you're with North, you were employed by Northeastern University? I'm sorry? No, you no, sir. by Northeastern University? Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Ken Krukemeyer. I am a resident of the South End. I've been there for 52 years. Um, and I was one of the highway commissioners for Massachusetts in the 1980s. Uh, my name is the signatory of, on the construction documents for the Southwest Corridor. Uh, I was project manager for that. And so I have a lot of familiarity with this particular project. Uh, and I was asked by people in Lower Roxbury, because I live just a little on the other side of Mass Avenue, to join them uh, when this project began. And I have subsequently become a member of the Friends of Melnia Cass Boulevard. So 
Um, it's a project that uh, I have looked at very carefully in terms of both the original drawings, uh, which I happen to have, of Melanie Cass Boulevard, and of the uh, proposed changes that you now see in the PIC in front of you. So you're with Northeastern University? No, sir. I have nothing to do with Northeastern Eastern University. I'm retired. Uh, I did, I did treat, teach transportation at MIT for 15 years, but I am no longer teaching there. So yes. uh, counting a number of your comments are related more to the fourth item on the agenda, which okay. is the repair plan, which is, so yeah. just for the purpose of sequencing. Please, uh, thank you so much. So before, I think Rick, it looks like you're trying to, but I want to make sure we're going through this in, in order. This, uh, this item is about the widening and relocation at Columbus and Melnia. Are there other questions or comments about this widening and relocation action? No. Okay. Um, all right. With that, I'll entertain a motion on the widening and relocation. Yeah. Make a motion yeah. to approve the joint petition by the City of Boston Transportation Department and Northeast University for the widening and relocation of the existing right of way lines of Columbus Avenue, as read into the record by the chair, and as shown on the plan entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division Widening and Relocation Plan. Columbus Avenue, Melania Cass Boulevard, reconstruction, Roxbury, one sheet dated May 29th, 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, so moved. Our third item is on a joint petition by the City of Boston Transportation Department, the City of Boston Public Works Department, and the City of Boston Department of Neighborhood Development, and the Boston Water and Sewer Commission for the widening and relocation of the existing right of way lines of Albany Street, a public way in Roxbury, located on the uh, southeasterly side southwest of Melnia Cass Boulevard, as well as its northwestly side, northeast of Melnia Cass Boulevard. This was new business on June 20th, 2019, and this is shown on a plan entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division Winding and Relocation Plan, Albany Street, Melnia Cass Boulevard, Reconstruction, Roxbury, one sheet dated May 29th, 2019. Uh, so bus drop off area to the Orchard Garden School. On the northern side, we're relocating the Albany Street as well as adding a cycle lane up to the first block to the north of Melanie Cass Boulevard. So, that's about, so this is about a 2,000 square foot uh, widening and the one for Melanie Cass uh, or uh, the north side is about 6,300 square feet. So the purpose of the widening relocation on the southern side is for the, the bus drop off Right, and on the northern side, can you? Yes, get the ranch and crosswalk all within the highway. Right. Okay. And then you just walk through the purpose of the one on the north side? Well, on the north side, it's why because we're, we're actually relocating it. Um, we're, we're actually redoing the intersection of Street, so we're re relocating it so this aligns with each other. And we're also adding a bike lane that's not there today that goes to this Randall Street, which goes up one block to the north side. It's a little bit wider of a section. If I may, the, the existing intersection is skewed. And so what we're trying to do is make all the improvements um, that are consistent within the corridor, that being the protected intersections and getting everything within the right-of-way. In order to do so, we created a chicane on Albany Street in order to square up the intersection a bit and make those crossings as short as possible while providing all of the uh, safety improvements at each of the corners. Uh, of significant note, that chicane opens up um, a much wider area for the bus stop, and that's uh, of importance being adjacent to the school, so we can create a much uh, much larger place for uh, onboarding and offboarding. And the the area here will also be um, utilized by uh, it's from the Boston Water and Sewer, so it's also city layout. Questions or comments on this widening relocation? Uh, there is comment from Boston Water and Sewer Commission. The, um, there is area that is currently under our jurisdiction, really. It's Boston Water and Sewer property. There has been ongoing negotiations about getting this agreement about what's going to be happening with the property. At this time, that it has not been approved. There has been no signature for that. Yes. And is it, just to be clear, Boston Water and Sewer will still own this property. This is just an easement to get this piece of property into the right of way. It will not change uh, your ownership of the fee interest. That's one of the things that I've been made aware that may not still be considered. That's what I've got to make sure that we don't keep this in our property. Yep. 
Other questions or comments on that? Yeah. Amir Todd. Allison. Hello again, Allison Pultonis. Um, related to Albany Street and the um, easement that's been requested from Boston Water and Sewer, um, uh, if all the agreements haven't been signed, sealed, and delivered, um, this vote should be delayed. Thank you. Are we, can we take a contingent vote up to Allison's point, or what's the? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that the, the document about the future of the land is kind of a slightly separate from the notion of this is a highway easement, there is no land being transferred through this action. Right. Um, so I think that we are, like Pat's in conversation with, with water and sewer, so I think that, yeah, I think, it, I mean, it can be contingent on the, the final documentation being um, verified by B, BWSC. Um, but yeah, this, this won't change owner, land ownership, the action that we're taking here. Right So that's what, as soon as we do have that, I think we're okay with everything else that had to do with the assignment. But to Allison's point. Got it. Okay. Other questions or comments? All right. Um, I'll entertain a motion on this item again, contingent upon uh, Boston Water and Sewer's final sign off. Make a motion to approve the joint petition by the City of Boston Transportation Department, the City of Boston Public Works Department. City of Boston Department of Neighborhood Development and the Boston Water and Sewer Commission for the widening and relocation of existing right of way lines of Albany Street is read in the record by the chair. And are shown a set of plans entitled City of Boston Public Works Department, Engineering Division, Winding Relocation Plan, Albany Street, Nolia Cass Boulevard, Reconstruction, Roxbury, one sheet dated May 29, 2019, would be continued upon approval by Boston Water and Sewer. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Moving on to our fourth item on a petition by the City of Boston Transportation Department for the making of specific repairs within the following public ways in Roxbury, consisting of curb realignment, roadway and sidewalk reconstruction, as well as new and relocated pedestrian ramps, specialty pavement, uh, street lights, street furniture, street trees, landscaping, storm drain infrastructure, bicycle infrastructure, tabled intersections, and driveway curb cuts. The locations are Melanie Cass Boulevard, generally between Columbus Avenue and Massachusetts Avenue. Columbus Avenue, generally at Melnia Cass Boulevard, Tremont Street, northeast and southwest of Melnia Cass Boulevard, Brook Marshall Road, southwest of Melnia Cass Boulevard, Sojourner Truth Court, southwest of Melnia Cass Boulevard, Shaman Avenue, northeast and southwest of Melnia Cass Boulevard, DeWitt Drive, northwest of Shaman Avenue, Washington Street, northeast and southwest of Melnia Cass Boulevard, Harrison Avenue, northeast and southwest of Melnia Cass Boulevard, Albany Street, northeast and southwest of Melnia Cass Boulevard, Hamden Street, north and south of uh, Melnia Cass Boulevard. This was new business on June 20th, 2019, and this has shown on a set of plans entitled City of Boston Public Works Department, Engineering Division, Specific Repair Plan, Melanie Cass Boulevard Reconstruction, Roxbury 20 Sheets in May 29th, 2019. Well, I'm going to go through the general improvements and take specific questions from there. There's a lot of agenda there. Uh, in general, we are reducing the travel lanes in Melanie Cass Boulevard. Today, they range anywhere from 11 feet to 14 feet wide, so we're making them consistent 10 and a half feet wide. Um, we're also uh, basically maintaining two lanes of travel in these directions to this day. And, and as you mentioned, there are some left turn lanes, particularly if the main sections like Washington House and that will be maintained. Uh, we're also tightening up this uh, right turn from Tremont Street to Nonnet Cass Boulevard. It's a pretty wide right turn now. We'll be reconstructing that island there. We'll have raised planted islands too. If we head down here, Brook Miles Road will we'll be uh, connected to Nonnet Cass Boulevard. We'll be a right turn all the way out. So there's a we have a closing island here, it will obviously be signed for right turn only. Uh, we'll go to St. John or not true court. I uh, mentioned this earlier, there will actually be a raised intersection, so this will be either a flush, it will be a flush condition for the bike lane. I think there's still a pedestrian ramp for about three inches. We, did, uh, we talked to public safety officials, uh, and they didn't want the full six inch on that one. So uh, we also have, we also have, we're actually getting rid of the landscape island from that uh, exists today from uh, Tremont Street. Okay, outside of this group, Marshall Road, we can get to that after meeting that's there today. There will be another country meeting as well, just past Harrison Ave, and then it continued from about Hamden Street up to Mass Ave, that's all the road. Producing protect, protect 
the intersection group. And all the intersections here, which are, you don't know these are that. Uh, this plan here, the bike lane is showing in the, the rust tower, in the cement concrete sidewalk is showing yellow. And, you know, these protected intersections will uh, they provide a lot more visibility than a regular intersection. They also will physically separate all the modes of traffic to the vehicles, pedestrians, and bikes are all separated by these. It's hard to see from where you are, but they're, they're actually raised out to separate everyone. Um, also, there's, it provides more queuing for the pedestrians in the in place of so the cars are actually back here, so there's even more visibility. Um, all these intersections have had this, uh, dedicated pedestrian bike signal timing too. Uh, and also mentioned we have, we have a couple of raised intersections at, at Washington Street. Uh, these are traffic calming, but also you know, this is a, there's a lot of activity here. Uh, you know, you know, the Silver Line runs down Washington Street. And we also propose a raised intersection at Albany Street. Uh, once again, with the Orchard Garden School. And uh, I also forgot to mention that uh, we do have a raised crossing at Brook Marshall and Charlotte Island also has a raised crossing. So, uh, so as far as pedestrian accommodations, uh, there are some sections that are compliant with the American Disabilities Act, so obviously we fix all that. The pedestrian lane will be a seven feet wide cement concrete sidewalk, both sides of the whole distance, which is about, you know, surprise almost a mile long. Uh, we obviously be uh, reconstructing the ramps and they'll have the yellow protective warning panels. For the bike lanes, they'll, they'll range from the size from six to eight feet. And the material changes, it's, uh, it's either going to be it's either traditional uh, uh, asphalt or maybe some sections of porous asphalt. And uh, as that into it, we'll also be planting several hundred, a couple hundred trees. Uh, and we'll also be replacing all the street lights and the pendant style. And I think some of these uh, uh, pedestrian style lights with the acorn lights. Um, yeah, as far as uh, specialty, I think we do have some concrete pavers with like all these, these uh, separated, the buffer islands of the uh, protected section will have uh, concrete pavers and there's some sections uh, on the bike path where it's not separated by a lawn, it'll be separated by a stamped concrete. And uh, lastly, for stormwater management, we're trying to make as much stormwater infiltration as possible. We have, uh, it's mostly subsurface with uh, concrete drywalls or galleys, uh, but we do have near Albany Street, we do have a bioretention area as well. That, Rick. I appreciate that um, in no particular order, um, but uh, we can talk first about just the lights. Um, so what's the, what's the lighting that's going to be on the corridor itself, and what's the light that's going to be on the pedestrian path? Yep. So we worked with the Boston Lighting Department to determine the fixtures, but a full photometric plan was done to make sure that we had street scale and pedestrian scale lighting along the corridor um, with the pedestrians and the bikes being offset from the road and protected. We wanted to make sure that adequate lighting was provided for safety. In addition, uh, the city has already begun um, during our design process, some tree trimming and maintenance, a lot of the existing lights were blocked by existing overgrown trees. And we have taken great care to place the new lighting, uh, a, a minimum, I believe, of 15 feet. I, I think it's 15 feet from each of the, the existing trees. And we have tried not to plant any new trees near it to make sure that maintenance is uh, as easy as possible going forward to keep this new lighting uh, operational and uh, lit. So that way that the sidewalk, the bike, the bike lane and the roadway all have the appropriate safety. Um, can you walk us through it? Pat, you covered this at the beginning, Rick, you mentioned this, but just walk us through the tree plan, uh, the implications this has for the uh, sort of trees today and uh, what would be planted after this. Did we bring the tree plan? I don't have. Yeah, so the, the I, I'm, I apologize, I don't have the tree plan with the official count in front of me, but throughout uh, the iterations of the design, going all the way back to the rapid transit design, it was really an obliteration of the corridor because we're widening um, and uh, widening out into both sides of the road. Hearing from the community that the bus rapid transit was not a viable option for the extended crossings, as well as the loss of trees, a more complete streets approach was taken from the, uh, the basically a, a restart of this project in the project development process. Uh, we have been able to refine our tree loss from, uh, I believe the initial uh, cut was about 200 trees to be cut down. And we made it all the way to the PSNE documents with about 60 trees being removed. 
we do have a graphic, I apologize, not with me, that shows the existing tree canopy and then what the trees that are to be removed. And when you look at it from an aerial, uh, you can see that a significant portion of the canopy does remain. And in order to mitigate the 60 trees that are being removed, we are planting upwards of 200 trees. So there'll be a, a large net increase of trees along the corridor. And the trees that are being planted are um, specific, specific species that will grow in the corridor, be resistant to uh, the conditions here in New England, and provide um, the, the appropriate canopy so that way we can try and avoid the overgrowth that has occurred on the, with some of the existing trees. Uh, again, all of the trees to be planted have been uh, so, uh, selectively placed to try and minimize utility impacts and lighting impacts. And it was through uh, great coordination with the, the community in order to um, avoid certain trees, weave the, the bike path and the side rock around other trees, have some minimal clearances for others in order to save as many as possible. It was an iterative process from, I would say, Pat, would you say 2016-ish until today to save as many possible trees as we can. I'd also like to point out that the contract documents have, an, uh, have exhaustive measures for protection and for, um, uh, I guess what I'm looking for, uh, preservation of the existing trees. Before construction starts, there's a fertilization pro uh, uh, specification and tree pruning and root pruning and air spading specification to improve the health of the existing trees that are to remain, to give them a, a shot of life before they're impacted and stressed by construction. And we've had extensive coordination with MassDOT's project development and um, highway design landscape section in order to identify trees that are at risk and, and try and uh, protect those as much as possible. There is extensive tree protection where they're cladding and fencing and there is a special, special specification that requires the contractor on board to hire their own arborist that is to assess all of the trees and the construction efforts prior to them be commencing construction in coordination with MassDOT's resident engineer and the city's arborist. So there's quite a bit of you know, uh, checkoffs and fail safes to make sure that we're protecting the existing trees along the corridor in addition to ultimately four years from now when construction is wrapping up having uh, uh, 200 new trees planted. Thank you, Mark. One of the things which, uh, which kind of raises around the intersection design, can you just walk us through a protected intersection design and just the implications that has for crossing dis dis uh, distances? Absolutely. So uh, there's a little bit of history to that, trying to identify back in the project development phase, or is it going to be two-way bicycle on each side of the road, one side of the road, uh, and, where to the, and where in relation to the roadway and the building faces, uh, the property faces, would the sidewalk and the bicycle lane go in coordination with active transportation and uh, the cyclist union and uh, livable streets and all the other uh, um, community groups and, and, and the public. It was determined that uh, one-way cycle tracks on a separated, cycle, I'm sorry, separate, separated bike lanes would be the appropriate um, treatment for the bicycle facility and then currently the road the the roadway network has the sidewalk adjacent to it and the decision was made to put the sidewalk adjacent to the building faces so that way there was access to the property without having to cross the bicyclists and create an additional buffer from the roadway and the bicyclists for the sidewalk so the sidewalks is now will be adjacent to the building face uh, property face, the cycle tracks will be adjacent to the roadway, but not adjacent actually, you know, you reach out and touch a car, there is a buffer between the curb line of about five feet and, and larger in certain instances to have uh, protection from the cyclists. As the cyclists and the pedestrians enter into an intersection, they will have their own dedicated crossings. And the idea behind that is to protect the vulnerable users from the vehicular traffic. That being, uh, to, to demonstrate, I guess, is that as a vehicle approaches the intersection at a stop line, the bicycles and the pedestrians are already ahead of them, waiting in a safe refuge that is protected by a curb. And as a car makes its turn onto a side street, it has an almost perpendicular view of the pedestrians in the crosswalk. The crossings are concurrent, and this was many discussions that had happened with Walk Boston and the community. I understand that everyone would always like to have a, a, an, ex an exclusive phase for every time the signal comes up, but operations and, and volumes through this, this uh, connector are, are quite high. 
and we are doing our best to make this a neighborhood street while maintaining that arterial connection. As I stated earlier, it's not an operations project, it's a safety project. Um, so we have done our best and with the, uh, the signals are gonna, will operate as concurrent and the lead time that pedestrians and bicyclists have to get out into the protected waiting areas and become visible uh, through the lead pedestrian interval to give them a head start uh, will provide plenty of time and, and notice and put them much more visible in the driver's uh, viewing than they are today. Um, I think it's not appropriate to count the area of the pedestrian crossing that is protected as time to get across. All of the timings for the signal are from where the pedestrians start to where they have to end. But the protected portion of that crossing is just that. You are protected from oncoming vehicles. The vulnerable users are not out in traffic. And in the crossing distances that are in the way of the vehicular paths are as short as possible and have been designed to be timed and crossed safely. Signal timing also came up, and you can touch on this, Mark, but uh, we're looking at LPIs. You can talk about the signal timing sure. plan and the, along the corridor. Can I talk about yeah, the signal timing plan? Exactly. Uh, with great coordination with uh, BTD, uh, the, the signal timings, uh, I, I apologize, I am not a traffic engineer, but they, they have been coordinated with, with um, Don Burgess and his staff at every design phase. The, the idea is to maintain operations and not make them any uh, worse than they are. And we're trying uh, to do our best to not create gridlock out here. The concurrent uh, crossings was really the, the, I know it's an issue that comes up over and over again, but that was one that was highly recommended by BTD in order to maintain operations, yet still with a lead pedestrian interval, give enough time for pedestrians to get out and cross while maintaining vehicular operations. One of the things you had started with was talking about the slip lane at Tremont and Melnia. I know that that was something which I think in various iterations has, has yeah. changed. Can you talk about that evolution and what the... Sure thing, was? yeah. So um, during the concept design report, this would be before the 25% design, there were numerous conversations with BTD about operations and queue lengths at that intersection. Um, and again, the number one goal here was to make safety improvements, but every time we did a different lane balance at that intersection to drop a lane to make the crossing shorter, maybe eliminate the slip lane entirely and make it just a right turn, I had extremely, extremely negative impacts, um, backing traffic up all the way to Ruggles and, and providing not enough left turn queuing storage and processing of vehicles through the intersection. And that would obviously create a public safety issue and, and, and a detriment to the uh, MBTA operations at Ruggles as well. So we had to find a balance, and that's kind of what the whole project has been, is a balance of uh, pedestrian and bicycle safety against vehicular safety and operations. And so we came up with three, four, five uh, concepts in the concept design report, and it was determined that we did need a slip lane in order to maintain operations appropriately at this intersection and, and not queue all the way back to Ruggles. And once that that was established, we tried to come up with as many um, wrinkles and, and variations in order to make that slip lane as tight um, and as slow and as visible as possible. And with help through the community in that con in, in the uh, basically the concept design process and the 25% design process, we were able to make a variant on the 25% design which was submitted and present three or four operations at a community working session where the community could take post-it notes and on each of the three alternatives that we had presented, write down what they liked and disliked about it, and we were able to take that feedback and synthesize it and come up with the option that is here today. Uh, the option that was presented on the today had almost unanimous uh, positive feedback. Basically, we're trying to slow the vehicles down, make them turn at a much tighter radius, not a sweeping free right, and it is signalized with an overhead signal now, there. so when pedestrians are pushing the button across, there will be a red, and it is raised, and we are providing uh, striping and, and signage ahead of the raised crossing to notify vehicles that they are entering into a different condition and that they should be slowing down. Uh, just to add, uh, Chief, on the Tremont um, slip lane, 
when we looked at the option to uh, remove the slip lane entire, entirely, what we had to do was reallocate that lane to Tremont Street, which widened Tremont Street into more lanes, a longer crossing, and um, we didn't want to do that. And um, uh, the community, uh, the friends uh, as well, did not like that idea <clears throat> to widen Tremont Street. So that's, um, again, another reason why we ended up going back to the uh, a refined uh, slip lane at Tremont, making, you know, changing the radius, raising the profile, making it safer. It is fully signalized as well. Thank you, Pat. Um, you talk about bio, uh, sort of uh, water retention, bio retention. Can you talk a little bit about some of the stormwater treatments that you are putting into place in, in this time? Well, actually, the, the plan, we've actually had a good, we've actually staggered South Shore Administration all along as far as I don't I don't have every single spot on yet. I'm not sure they might have shown me if I could the glass water so we approval uh the only place we were actually put uh, a surface street that you can see would be off the gate we have a bio retention area on the Baldwin Street. But do that they use the subsurface all along this car so we pick up the catch basin from the street and infiltrate as much as we can. I don't think we got the full inch but we, we try to do as much as we could along the whole car. So in addition to that, the bike lanes in between the intersections will have permeable pavement and allow for infiltration and have a, a sub-base that will uh, allow the groundwater to get back into the system, into the, the natural system. And we do, as Rick said, we, where we have fit in, we fit galleys in along the way where, where possible. The bioretention area was coordinated closely with Boston Water and Sewer and widened even at the 100% level to, you know, fill up as much of the space that we were taking in with, the, with the easement and provide as much bioretention for them. Uh, and, and it's actually the way it's designed allows the Boston Water and Sewer then in the future to create a stepped bioretention area and, and increase their, their, their um, I guess what you would call like a demonstration project out in their front door, you know, and be able to coordinate that and not uh, preclude them from growing it in the future. Um, and the only reason why the the cycle tracks are permeable between the intersections has to do with the high friction surface treatment that we are uh, painting along the cycle tracks at the intersections to provide notice and, and signage and striping entering the the, the change in condition, and that can't be porous. Um, thinking about this really way of things. Conduit for telecom, are we? Yeah, I, no, um, but it's probably practical at this point. Yes. Uh, Especially the desk. That's exactly what I was yeah. saying. They should be in contact with you, basically relative to street lighting that they're looking for antennas. So have you had any conversation with them? Sorry, I missed, Chris, what you were saying, uh, Amy, what, what exactly should we be unaware of? Uh, so we're running essentially blank uh, space for fiber optic conduits. As soon as you finish this, every DAS antenna provider is going to come and ask for a street light that you just installed. Um, so the notion of getting them and putting their lights in kind of concurrent with your project or not putting in brand new lights that they'll rip out four hours later. Okay. Um, but we can coordinate that after this. Yeah, it's going to be important. Yeah. Good to know. We'll, we'll make sure we talk to MassDOT before we advertise it. Other questions or comments? What about, what about snow removal plans for bike lanes? What, what, is, what is that? Pat, um, we, we had operational meetings with um, <coughs> Public Works Department and to ensure that the machinery was able to fit through and we um, made certain that at the protected intersection maneuverability was maintained and our dimensions reflect the ability to maintain and to allow for machinery to, to get in there. So that was a good point to bring up that um, we had to have a certain uh, dimension in order to maintain it properly for snow removal and leaves. Yeah. You know, the feedback we had received was that there was some problematic issues with the ComAV uh, maintenance, and we wanted to make sure that we weren't repeating the same mistakes. Uh, with the protected intersections, it does allow the snow equipment to come right out through the intersection and then do a loop and come back and basically, you know, make that right turn, just like almost like a little mini clover leaf for the 
for the, the Bobcat equipment, and we did maintain six and a half feet at uh, those turning movements, and it, uh, only a couple of pinch points along the corridor on the straightaways does it come down to six, but the equipment still fits on that. Great. You're welcome. Other questions or comments? Amy or Todd? Allison? Hi again, uh, Allison Pultonis, and um, so many things to say. I'll try and be brief. Um, obviously, the, the road is called a boulevard, but it's not really a boulevard because it's you know not a grand street like Commonwealth, et cetera. Um, and it's not a parkway, even though it's had hundreds of trees on both sides. And so this is a very complex problem of taking down trees and then figuring out locations for new trees that won't conflict with the street lights and so on. And um, I don't think it's resolved yet. Um, we did hear uh, at the June 20th meeting that 101 trees were coming out. And today we're hearing 60. Um, we were told 62, I believe, at the 75% design uh, informational meeting that was held in December by BTD. Um, so it has been a moving target in the 70 40 of the trees that are coming out are already dead. That's the difference in the 100. Just thought I'd let everybody know. Oh, OK. That's good to know. Um, however, Mass DOT's arborist, uh, the, uh, the work that he did for the uh, consultants uh, showed less than 10 dead trees. So again, there's been a lot of uh, different information presented and not enough uh, public uh, review, of course, because we haven't seen the 100% in, in uh, drawings. Um, I do want to say, and this is relevant maybe to everything that the commission does, is because of climate change, um, and this is a designated heat island on this particular stretch of the road, both because of the amount of impervious surface, but the traffic, et cetera. Um, but the city is seeing that in more and more areas. And so it would be really good to have uh, a role for the Public Health Commission on the PIC to help think about some of these things that are going on. Um, so the neighborhood has been focused on that concept of the heat island issue and what it means to take down mature shade trees that have been pretty healthy for over 35 years. So um, it is important, the number. And we're hearing today a replacement rate of three to four times what's coming down. However, it's the number, again, is a moving target. What we read in, in the 75% design plans was that 268 trees were going to have their roots impacted by excavation. And that's a really complicated process. And you know that what will happen in the construction is going to, we're going to lose more. I mean, that is inevitable. It happened on Commonwealth as well. So that's, that's a, overriding issue for the neighborhood. And uh, obviously, the Parks Department is involved with trees. And we, we're assuming that there will be a public hearing and review by par the tree warden before the project goes to bid, because um, they need those approvals. However, just to make sure that calling this project a widening project doesn't preclude uh, hearings with the tree warden, because sometimes exceptions are made that way. So that's. That's significant. Um, related to the locations for new trees, that's also something the Parks Department should be involved in. And um, we're hoping that that process, too, is shared with the community, um, again, before uh, uh, the project is uh, bid to uh, developers. So uh, related to complete streets, um, this became a complete streets project in BTD's words. However, it's not listed as a complete streets project in Mass DOT's tip because it was a highway project from the beginning. In fact, of course, it was supposed to be a transit project with BRT lanes, although the MBDA was not involved in that. So um, again, we just have to say that there is a lot to say, but um, Complete streets guidelines that are on the city's website say medians in the street, if there's trees planted there, they're supposed to be 16 to 18 feet wide. And these plans that Todd shared with us uh, two weeks ago, those show those medians between um, Albany and Mass Ave. I 
they look like they're less than 10 feet. And that is not going to accommodate enough soil to um, you know, grow healthy trees. So that just is not going to work, and those trees should not be counted as a, for the uh, replacement trees. You can do green medians, but uh, to try and waste money planting trees there that will not survive is not a good use of uh, project money. Um, so I'm sure there's more to say, but I, <laughs> this is all I can think of right now. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Just to walk through some of those, sorry, just to walk through some of those. So can you just walk us back through the the tree count, um, how many trees are being removed, of the trees that are being removed, how many are, are dead and how many trees are being removed? There are, we started with an arborist back in 17 and we identified every tree and gave it a unique identification number and, the, and an assessment of its health. In February of 2018, knowing that we were going, I'm sorry, in February of 2019, no, yeah, 19, knowing we were going to advertisement this year, we updated that assessment and had the arborist go back out. Obviously, there were some changes in conditions. Uh, there were some trees that were no longer there. There were some trees that had been planted and were brand new. And there were some trees that had changed in their condition. And so we used that updated assessment from the arborist, and we updated all of our construction documents to be as current as possible. Today's count is about 60 healthy trees are coming down, and there are 40 dead and poor trees that we have been recommended by MassDOT, the arborist, the city's arborist, and our landscape design team that should be removed because they will not survive with or without construction within the next five to 10 years. So that's the difference in the tree count. When we say 60, I know everybody's really focusing on the trees that are there and are healthy. So anything that's not dead or poor is in that count for 60, and there's approximately 40 additional trees that are in dead to poor condition. And the number of trees that are being planted? Yeah, the number of trees being planted is around 200. I'll, I'll, if you want, I'll make sure I get all those exact numbers to you. What's that? Closer to 250. Uh, and if a contractor with, with one of the trees that is in good health, if the contractor damages the trees, I realize you sort of outlined all the things that you would hold the contract and the requirements for the contractor to take care of the trees during the course of construction. But what is the restitution if a contractor damages a, a living tree? Is that, that's a contract term that we would need to work through. Yeah, the mass style will have to determine that uh, in the field with the contractor. But the idea is to not get to that point because we have the arborist that they have to hire that must coordinate with the city's arborist prior to impacting any tree. And there'll be, uh, you know, uh, as there are many other pre-construction items that need, must, be, must happen, assessing the trees, identifying them, and marking them prior to be commencement of construction is one of the first action items by the contractor. And that is not done in a vacuum. And then can you just touch on the, the, the median issue? Sure. Um, you know, I think the, the medians, they, depending on what you're trying to do, provide benefits or a disservice, right? So you add a median and you're increasing the crossing. You add a median and sometimes with a planted median, you're slowing down traffic and that's good for a corridor. So it was a balance throughout the corridor about where to include medians and where to remove them. So where we needed operational, um, uh, I don't want to say improvements, where we need to maintain operations for the left turn lanes and whatnot, the medians had to come out. However, as you are coming from the Mass Ave connector and the highway and entering this, this corridor, you know, the idea from the get-go from the public and from the, 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 the community, the, the design team, was to create a slower street, a safer street, a more neighborhood-friendly street, even though it is an arterial and it does pro process a lot of traffic. So the idea was um, presented to us from the communities from the community to include that median as you enter the Mass Ave connector and you come into Melnia Cass Boulevard to have that planted median. And it does have some interesting geometry where it kind of creates a bit of a chicane in the road as well to slow traffic down. You want people's mentality as they're coming off the connector and getting to that Mass Ave intersection to understand they're no longer on the highway, they're no longer on a connector road to the highway, and they're entering the city of Boston at a 25 mile an hour speed limit. So we've designed the medians and the roadway at that 25 mile an hour design speed and made sure that where possible, we're including traffic calming measures such as 
medians, chicanes, raised crossings, raised intersections, signage striping as necessary to still process traffic, but slow people down and make it a safer environment and a more friendly street. Uh, just to add, uh, Chief, as well, and commissioners, for the survivability of the trees on the medium, uh, recognizing that um, oftentimes trees planted in medians um, during winter time, uh, plowing and salt deteriorates the soil condition and the plantings. So what we did was we um, we added a terracing uh, to the medians. So the, the medians are raised. So there's an additional step back and uh, curb reveal that would uh, allow for the plowing to take place and salting, sanding, and create an additional barrier, um, you know, to allow the soil to, um, you know, not be uh, infiltrated by the roadway treatment. Thank you. Other questions or comments on that? I'd like to start out by saying that um, whether it's 60 trees or 100 trees, uh, the neighborhood is concerned about the trees. And so 60 trees is still uh, too many. But nevertheless, the real question that we're getting at here also is what is the damage to the existing trees? And I would like to compliment the engineers and the city in doing a very careful analysis of the trees but when you look at the drawings, they do show that an enormous amount of the root structure of the trees is being disturbed by the new construction, by the relocation of the roadway over to, let's say, two or three feet closer to an existing tree that is being expected to live in spite of that disruption. The trees are being expected to live that are going to be covered by the new, where their root structure is going to be covered by the new pervious pavement. And when you look at their drawings, you will see that the pervious pavement requires digging down into the earth, into the root structure of those trees by a distance of, I haven't measured the drawing, but I'm guessing a foot and a half or two to place the gravel beneath the pervious pavement. So here again, through a decision about where the path is going to be located going across those routes or where the path is being located over the top of or, or at the location of the existing sidewalk, we're going to be digging up that root structure that is currently there. Um, I don't doubt for a minute that both the neighborhood and the engineers want to put the best spin on this project. And so the descriptions that they are giving of things are going to be different than the descriptions we give. But I would suggest that you take a look at the drawings and try to figure out who is right, that you actually take a look at the drawings and see how much of the root structures that they have very carefully defined as being underneath the new pathways and the new roadways and so forth are, because of the depth of construction, going to be severely impacted, and whether any of those 180 extra trees are really going to survive the work that is being done. Um, that balancing act is very important. And where decisions could have been made to relocate the sidewalk or the bike path or leave the bike path right where it is um, in order to save the trees were decisions that were not made. And so in deciding whether this project is ready to go ahead or not, I think it's essential for you to see the specifics in the drawings. Um, let's go to lighting for just a moment. I, we've done an analysis of the existing of the PIC drawing on the top and the layout of the street lighting and path lighting uh, that was originally constructed in the 1978 plans from the Southwest Corridor. The spacing of the lighting for the, um, for the bike path, which has been described as new acorn lights, lights that the bicyclists, by the way, dislike greatly because of the amount of glare in their eyes, um, is being put in at 75 to 90 feet, where the existing lights are put in at 50 feet. Now, the city has not maintained all of those 50, and in some cases, the lights are at 100 feet. But 
in the Southwest Corridor, the continuation of this bike path out to Forest Hills, the DCR has retrofit the existing spacing, 50-foot spacing, with LED downlights, the same things that the city uses, and universally the cyclists along that corridor who ride it at night say the lighting is fabulous. Now, how many times have you heard about city lighting that it is fabulous? Um, go out there in the evening before you approve this project to put in acorn lights at 75 to 90 feet and take a look at what a continuous lighting system that connects with the Southwest Corridor along Melnia Cass could do to provide good lights on the new bike path that's going to be created. Um, those are parts of the disagreements about details that I think are really important. We will take a look at the question of the location of the bike path. You're told it's generally going to be five feet away from the roadway when it is next to the roadway. Without the separation of the trees, that cyclists really like to separate the bike, biking from the roadway and the noise and the lights of the cars on the tree, on, on, the, on the road. Uh, when I look at those same drawings, I see that that dimension is three feet and that it's often a hard surface so that when the snow plow comes through, it puts the snow on top of that three feet and much of the bike path and then when the bike path plow comes along, it's gonna have to put the snow back into the roadway. Again, problems that could have been avoided by a different decision about the location of the bike path. And in fact, that's exactly what's done in what you've just approved, which is moving the sidewalk over into Morgan Memorial and keeping the bike path where the sidewalk now is, behind the trees and away from the roadway. If that same strategy that is used in several places by the engineers along Melnia Cass Boulevard had been used continuously, then the problem that Public Works will have to deal with, which is plowing already plowed snow out of the bike path, could have been avoided. The neighborhood's been saying this for now four years since we took pictures of the snow plowed onto the space uh, next to the Melnia Cass Boulevard and said, this is not the place where you want to put a bike path, uh, and yet, the way it is in these drawings. You shouldn't approve something that's going to create so much havoc for the Public Works Department to try to take care of. In fact, the layout of these very complex intersections, which I've already shown you with the locate distance for the crosswalks, is something that even in the highway design manual that is prepared by Mass Highway for separated bike paths, shows how the public can be allowed as the pedestrian to come up to the intersection before crossing the street. Uh, and the bike path can be kept back so that pedestrians can cross more conveniently and so that the bike path is away from the roadway and the plowed snow. And it gives you a layout that can be very easily plowed by any piece of equipment rather than by highly specialized bike path equipment that has to zigzag between the curbs in the design that's currently being proposed. So again, yes, they've talked with Public Works, but I think if they had really listened to the complexity and difficulty of trying to maintain the bike path on Commonwealth Avenue and would apply that, um, as they have said they have tried to do with their equipment to these new layouts and imagined taking care of all of the, what are the eight different intersections with this complex bike, sidewalk, roadway layout and considered the cost of doing that when the problem could have been avoided by a different elevation of the bike path in that area, a very similar geometric layout, but one where the plow doesn't have to get in between all these high curbs. Uh, the answer could be better for both the neighborhood, the residents who are trying to cross, and the city in terms of its responsibility for maintaining this roadway. These are decisions, engineering decisions that need to be made, and they should be made taking into account all of the responsibility, not just looking at one particular design in the highway design manual and deciding that one, which is most expensive, is the one that we should be building. Let me mention just very briefly a couple of other concerns. 
In terms of complete streets, uh, the engineers have said how wonderful it is that they're narrowing the roadway lanes from 11 or sometimes 14 feet to 10 and a half feet. At the same time, they probably should have been tolding, telling you that they are widening the offset from the curb from one foot to two feet. So the total distance from the curb to the outside of the center lane is going to be exactly the same as it is out there right now. And so reducing the width of the lane by half a foot is not necessarily going to get the results that Complete Streets believes in. Uh, I think that that covers briefly, not too briefly, some of the concerns that the neighborhood feels still deserve to have been resolved, that believes that, in fact, the reality, the truth of what is being designed needs to be quite well understood by you um, as you vote on this project, and that looking at the details of the drawings and understanding the impact on the routes, understanding the type of lighting that's being proposed and whether it's going to actually be better. The street lights, as also seen in that drawing, in the new layout go up to 190 feet between poles, whereas right now out there it's between 75 and 90 feet. Is that going to give you better lighting? Uh, are there studies really showing what life is going to be like with a drop fixture that gives more glare in the eyes of the driver rather than the down lights, the LED lights that the city uses so successfully in other locations as fixtures that provide good lighting on the street, <coughs> less glare in the eyes of the public, the dri whether they're driving or riding a bicycle or walking. These are all details that could be done better. And the city, if $27 million is going to be spent on rebuilding this roadway, deserve to get much better than what they have right now. Thank you. Just um, on the street lighting, I'm pretty sure that we're using LED. It's just the, de the, the design is an acorn, but the illumination is LED. And I know that Mark, you touched on this before when we talked about lighting, but can you just uh, really respond to the spacing of the lighting and the, and the lighting of the road versus the lighting of the path, which I think you were differentiating between? Maybe I'm off on that. Yeah. Um try and be as polite as possible. I mean, I appreciate that in 1978, the spacing was 50 feet or 70 feet, but light bulbs have improved, and we hired a lighting consultant. We hired h and and their lighting division in order to do a complete photometric plan, and a professional engineer provided the input for the, for the Boston Lighting Department, had back and forth review, MassDOT's highway lighting section reviewed the plans and provided comment. The spacing is appropriate, the illumination is appropriate, the wattage, the lumens of these LED lights are going to make this look so much better than it is today. I have extreme confidence that the design is appropriate and designed appropriately. Ricky, in some ways you touched on the, the, uh, the raised crossings and what we are able to do and weren't able to do associated with raised crossings, which is sort of connected with Ken's, the design that Ken showed of a, of a red intersection that has a raised crossing. But can you talk to us about where you have raised crossings and where you, and where you don't have raised crossings and, and why we went with this design as opposed to what Ken is showing from last time? I mean, the only raised crossings we have are at Washington and Albany, right? So right, so. Uh, the, I think you mentioned Sojourner Truth. And, uh, right. So on the, on the side streets, uh, the idea of raised crossings is a traffic calming measure in order to provide more visibility and to slow the traffic and the turning moves down. And so we coordinated with Stephanie Seskin and the Active Transportation Department to make sure that we were providing very similar treatments that she's providing on many of her assignments. Um, if this did not have a capital project, I'm sure she would be trying to do the exact same thing as she's doing on Tremont Street and, and on Columbus as she's doing here. So the raised crossings are specifically for traffic calming and pedestrian safety at lower volume, uh, lower volume streets that did have turning radii that could have higher speeds. And so that's, that's the idea behind all of it. It's just protecting that vulnerable user from the vehicles making the turns. I, 
can I appreciate uh, and Allison, I appreciate uh, both your testimony and your engagement throughout this entire process. That engagement, no doubt, will, will also continue. Uh, I'm very mindful that what we are building is built uh, on the strong foundation which, uh, which you created in the first place. I've got a lot of confidence in the work of the team and the engagement they've done and the book and the in-depth review they've done on sort of all aspects of this. Uh, and I know that we'll have uh, continued conversations going forward on this, but I will I'll entertain a motion on, on this item uh, to uh, for the speaker of Paris on the I make a motion to approve the petition by the City of Boston Transportation Department for the making of specific repairs within the following public ways in Roxbury, consisting of curb realignment, roadway and sidewalk reconstruction, as well as new and relocated pedestrian ramps, especially pavement, street lights, street furniture, street trees, landscaping, storm drain infrastructure, bicycle infrastructure, table intersections and driveway curb cuts, as read into the record by the chair, and then shown the set of plans entitled City of Boston, Public Works Department, Engineering Division, specific repair plan, Melmia Cass Boulevard, Reconstruction, Roxbury, 20 sheets dated May 29th, 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Thank you so much. Moving on to our next item on a petition by RREF2 Kenmore Lessor 2 LLC for the making of specific repairs within the following public ways in Boston proper, consisting of curb realignment, sidewalk and pedestrian ramp reconstruction, as well as new and relocated specialty pavement, street trees, street lights, street furniture, storm drain infrastructure, bicycle infrastructure, and driveway curb cuts. Locations are Commonwealth Avenue on its northerly side, address number 535, east of Deerfield Street. And Beacon Street on its northerly side, and generally east of Deerfield Street. And Deerfield Street on its easterly side, north of Commonwealth Avenue, and Beacon Street. This was new business on uh, June 20th, 2019, and this is shown on a set of plans entitled, entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division. Specific repair plan, Beacon Street, Commonwealth Avenue, and Deerfield Street, 535 Commonwealth Avenue, Boston proper, four sheets, April 5th, 2019. with Related Beal. Thank you for having us this morning. Um, just to uh, do a little housekeeping, give everyone a little lay of the land. Um, we purchased a portfolio of nine buildings from Boston University in the heart of Kenmore Square back in October of 2016. Um, we have been in front of the BPDA um, and the zoning board over the last year and a half to approve our large project um, and plan development area number 121. Today, we are here to talk to you about uh, one component of that large project, which is um, in the, on the board, uh, in the place of buildings two, three, and four, um, we are constructing a 130,000 square foot commercial office building with ground floor retail um, and two stories below grade for uh, parking spaces. Uh, So the, the building on your left, we, we, we're calling the Commonwealth Building. Um, we are here today uh, to talk through um, a subtle canopy to differentiate the office entry from the ground floor retail that wraps the corner of Commonwealth and Deerfield. Um, to talk about the specific repair plans associated with our approvals, which extends the sidewalk um, into what is now a parallel parking lane um, to allow for a raised and buffered bike lane. Um, furnishing areas as well as a ADA uh, compatible uh, sidewalk. Um, and then in addition to that, we, uh, we've recently mobilized the site and are preparing a slurry wall foundation which, uh, which requires a guide wall in the, in the public way. Um, so we are here for that earth retention um, license as well. So I'm going to turn it over to our design team, McPhail, Kyle's like Landscape Architecture, and VHB, who will go through the specific actions. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Can you walk us through the specific repairs? So for this building project, I'll point out a couple of different things. This is the proposed building. The existing curb line is 
dashed here in red. And as Alex mentioned, the curb line is moving out to take over the space with the you know, current parallel parking spaces. What we get for that is um, a continuous pedestrian corridor, eight foot wide accessible route that's in concrete pavement. We have a um, protected bike lane cycle track that's um, at the sidewalk level and the curb line moves out. Be new street lighting in this area. We've met with street lighting. They've recommended the fixture and the spacing. There'll be new street tree planting as well. There's exist existing trees that would be removed. We're replacing those. We've already been through the tree hearing process. And then there is a um, frontage zone up against the building. The property line is shown here in the dashed white line. So that frontage zone straddles that line. And then between the concrete sidewalk and the cycle track is a pervious paper, so we'll be infiltrating water in that area. The trees will also be supported with structural soil to give them more rooting zone, and that's in the space between the concrete sidewalk and the second tree. And then we discussed this in, the, in new business. Uh, the driveway here is requirement because the driveway is, you can't essentially access it, is that right, from, uh, uh, from Deerfield Street? You cannot access the uh, the passageway, private passageway from, from Deerfield Street. Um, kind of two, two, two real reasons why uh, we were pushed there through our, our approval process. Uh, one, the, the neighbors did not want to push traffic down Bay State Road, a, a major yeah. residential zone. And, and two, uh, there are some ownership issues within those private passageways that uh, would require additional uh, sign off prior to, to doing something like that. So, down the line, if if things change with sort of the adjacent parcel, it would just be interesting to re-explore that. The, a driveway coming out of Kenmore Square it, it doesn't seem to work. It is not a great sort of fit for pedestrians and cyclists, the uh, folks who are in the roadway. So uh, but I realize that's not the condition that we have right now, or the option we have right now. Yeah, so, so we are not building into that yeah, right. passageway. Exactly. So yes. And uh, the this same design as we talked about before, the same design as what you would hear the next parcel down uh, when when you do the when you do the work further to the east. Is that right? Yes. This really is an enlarged an enlarged uh, plan of what is the entire block. Um, but we'll come back and show you it. It, it is all um, emulated across across the alleyway. Great. Other questions or comments on the physical repair portion is. Yes, there is. Um, we have in our place a site plan 19238 that involves what's going on at this location, and it's under review. There are issues that we still haven't been addressed that need to be considered before we would say that they're really approved. <coughs> so, if we were to make this contingent upon yes. please. Other questions? Yeah, here, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, the Commission for Person Disability uh, has been meeting with the proponent, and in conversations, we would we requested to consider um, replacement of two of the pedestrian crossings at the adjacent to the site. One of the crossings is across Comab, and the other crossing is uh, to, Deerfield. I forget the, the small Deerfield. street, um, the side street. Um, we received calls from constituents regarding the materials of those pedestrian crossings, which are um, asphalt, some granite pavers, some brick pavers, and the materials have become unstable, and they're uneven. So we would like um, replacement for those crossings with our standard asphalt and the white striping, the ladder design. <coughs> we discussed this in, in new business as well. This is correct if I'm wrong. This is part of the larger, the whole, like the whole intersection is filled with those pavers, right? And it's not asphalt. And that was a, a mass up project. Am I, am I misremembering? MBTA. MBTA, I'm sorry, MBTA project. All right, and, I, and is that something, can we make adjustments to the crosswalks as part of this? Uh, project. Can we put a granite edge to retain the papers yeah. and put asphalt in the middle so that the crossing itself is accessible? Asphalt? 
that. So, yeah. so the, the, re the reason it wasn't in any of our, our plans was because there was a lot of coordination with an adjacent project going on across the street, which we wanted, which we wanted to make ensure they had their approvals, which made sense for repaving those in the first place. Yeah. Um, we, we have coordinated with, with the other, uh, the adjacent owner, um, and to the, to the extent that they have their approvals and those sidewalks make sense, um, I, think we, I think we can revisit it. Great. And that would be both, that's an adjacent owner on, on the Deerfield Street parcel, not the MBTA, not the, the bus island, right? It's, uh, it's, it's uh, basically a, it abuts uh, Beacon Street and Commonwealth. Commonwealth. Okay. So it's the, it's the Citizens oh. Bank parcel. Got it. Yes. Right. But either the, the two crosswalks that we're discussing here are completely owned and controlled by the city of Boston um, and don't have any, like the adjacent parcels don't have a, um, any kind of say in this. The, it was installed by the MBTA and nobody's under an agreement to maintain it. Um, so this is really just what the city would like to see for these two crosswalks, not right. going so far as the whole intersection. Common, right. yes, this is yeah, just, just limited. As you come from your building across to the MBTA middle bus station and then across the airfield, that the actual material that you walk on when you cross that street is asphalt, not papers. I understand. I, I, it, was, it was more about how the pedestrians were going to be crossing those those right. streets through to the median or across the right. airfield, same yeah. thing with the yeah. cyclists, um, that we didn't understand yeah. at, at, at yep. that time. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's absolutely something we can revisit. Great. Thank you. Other questions or comments? All right. Um, I'll entertain a motion on this item, again, contingent upon final sign off from water and sewer and the work with the uh, uh, Commission for Persons with Disabilities on those two crosswalks. I'll make a motion to approve the petition by REF. Two, Kenmore Lesser LLC in the making of specific repairs within the following public ways in Boston proper, consisting of curb realignment, sidewalk and pedestrian ramp even construction, as well as new and relocated specialty pavement, street lights, street trees, street furniture, storm drain infrastructure, bicycle infrastructure, and driveway curb cuts. As recommended by the chair, as shown on a set of plans entitled City of Boston Public Works Department. <coughs> Civic Repair Plan, Beacon Street, Commonwealth Avenue, and Deerfield Street, 535, Commonwealth Avenue, Boston Proper, four sheets dated April 5th, 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Our next item uh, is on a petition by RREF2, Kenmore Lessor L uh, 2 LLC, for the granting of an earth retention license for the installation of a temporary earth support system within the following public ways in Boston Proper. Commonwealth Avenue on its northerly side at address number 535, east of Deerfield Street. Beacon Street on its northerly side, generally east of Deerfield Street. And Deerfield Street on its easterly side, north of Commonwealth Avenue slash Beacon Street. This was new business on June 20th, 2019, and this is as shown on a set of plans entitled City of Boston Public Works Department, Engineering Division, License Plan, Temporary Earth Retention Plan, Deerfield Street and Commonwealth Avenue, 535 Commonwealth Avenue, and 660 Beacon Street, Fenway, Kenmore, Four Sheets Day, June 17th, 2019. Good morning, I'm Jonathan Patrick for Fail Associates. We're the geotechnical engineer on the project. Um, as Alex mentioned, uh, there's gonna be a two levels of below grade parking, and to construct that, there's gonna be slurry wall construction. But in order to construct the slurry wall, we first need to demolish the existing buildings, which are founded on wood piles and caissons. So those, those uh, foundations go right up to the property line currently. So in order to remove those foundations, we need to be outboard them into the public way um, and for that, we're going to install a soldier pollen lighting system uh, first to allow us to remove the foundations. Um, then following that, the soldier piles would be cut down, the appropriate depth below grade. Um, it'd be backfilled up to grade, and then the concrete guide walls for the slurry wall construction would also be constructed in the public way. After the slurry wall construction, those guide walls would be removed as well. Um, other geotechnical issues on the um, project, um, We've uh, coordinated with the Boston Ground Water Trust. Um, we'll be monitoring groundwater levels in the vicinity of the project. And also, um, there are organic soils present on the, on the site. So the contractor um, will be prepared to um, implement odor control, control measures. Um, and lastly, um, there'll be vibration monitoring performed uh, uh, for the um, adjacent buildings and also for um, some Boston water and sewer utilities as well, specifically a water line. Are there any questions? We've worked out a uh, construction management plan, taking that into consideration that uh, has recently been signed off, so we're happy with the, uh, the plan going forward. And you're about 
particular thing, what they propose for this particular portion of the work here. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Amir Todd, members of the public. All right. I'll entertain a motion on the earth retention license. I, I make a motion on a petition to, to approve a petition by <coughs> RREF2, Kenmore Lesser 2, LLC, for the granting of an earth retention license for the installation of a temporary earth support system within the following public ways in Boston proper, as read into the record by the chair and also as shown on a set of plans entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division License Plan, Temporary Earth Retention Plan, Deerfield Street and Commonwealth Avenue, 535 Commonwealth Avenue and 660 Beacon Street, Benway Kenmore, four sheets dated June 17th, 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Our next item is on a petition by RREF2, uh, Kenmore Lesser 2 LLC, for the granting of a projection license for the installation of a canopy over a portion of Deerfield Street, a public way in Boston proper, located on its eastly side, generally north of Commonwealth Avenue slash Beacon Street, at number 535 Commonwealth Avenue. This was new business on June 20th, 2019, and this is shown on a plan entitled City of Boston Public Works Department, Engineering Division, License Plan, Deerfield Street, 535 Commonwealth Avenue, Boston proper, one sheet date April 5th, 2019. So uh, the projection license is for a eight foot uh, wide canopy of which three, three feet, six inches sit uh, above the, the public way um, in terms of depth. And then it, it runs 33 feet long, about 113 square feet um, within the public way. It is off of the, the main pedestrian thoroughfare um, onto Deerfield Street to activate the, the retail storefront <coughs> along the corner of Commonwealth and Beacon. Um, it will be 11 feet high above a uh, storefront system, double doors, um, and again, surrounded by street trees and the uh, ADA accessible eight foot uh, path ex uh, accessing it. Questions on the protection lessons? It's all you traced in terms of drain. <coughs> Great. Okay. Right. Amir Todd? Members of the public? Right. I'll entertain a motion on this item. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the petition by RBF2, Kenmore Lesser, to LLC for the granting of the direction license for the installation of Canty over a portion of Deerfield Street, as read into the record by the chair, and as shown in a set of plans entitled. City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division License Plan, Deerfield Street, 535 Commonwealth Avenue, Boston Proper, one sheet dated April 5th, 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Thank you so much. Moving on to our next item on a petition by 214 Market LLC for the acceptance of pedestrian easement adjacent to Market Street and Public Way in Brighton. Located on its eastly side at address number 214, generally between Saybrook Street and Lawrence Place. This was new business on June 20th, 2019, and this is shown on a plan entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division Pedestrian Easement Plan, 214 Market Street, Brighton, one sheet dated January 5th, 2019. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. My name is Matthew Eckel. I'm an attorney with Drago in Toscano. With me today is Jacob Simmons on behalf of 214 Market Street. Uh, we're here on agenda number eight as well as <coughs> number nine. Uh, by way of brief background, this petition is being made in conjunction with a mixed-use development at 214 Market Street in Brighton. It's at the corner of Market and Saybrook Street. The project contains one retail space at ground level, 29 residential units, and 32 parking spaces. The project went through the Article 80 small project review process and was approved by the BPDA board as well as the Zoning Board of Appeal. Uh, the agenda number eight, which we're speaking about first, is the pedestrian easement. This is a one-foot pedestrian easement being proposed, which will allow for a, a, five, a minimum of a five-foot clearance for pedestrian foot traffic. Uh, the reason that this is necessary relates to agenda number nine, which is proposing tree pits as well, which we can deal with later on. But uh, basically those tree pits necessitate this one-foot pedestrian easement uh, to allow for that pedestrian access way. 
So the zone would basically be 10 feet from the curb to the building face, with five feet for the pedestrian sidewalk and five feet for the plant for the furnishing zone. For the plant, correct. Yes. Correct. Questions on the pedestrian easement? Amir Todd, members of the public. All right, I'll entertain a motion on this item. I make a motion to approve a petition by 214 Market LLC for the acceptance of a pedestrian easement adjacent to Market Street, Brighton, located on its easterly side at address number 214, generally between Saybrook Street and Lawrence Place, as shown on a plan entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division Pedestrian Easement Plan, 214 Market Street, Brighton, one sheet dated January 5th, 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Our next item is on a petition by 214 Market LLC for the making of specific repairs within the following public ways in Brighton, consisting of curb and sidewalk reconstruction, as well as new and relocated pedestrian ramps, street trees, bike, bike racks, and driveway curb cuts. The locations are Market Street on its eastern side at address number 214 between Saybrook Street and Lawrence Place, and Saybrook Street on its northerly side between Market Street and Saybrook Ter Terrace. This was new business on June 20th, 2019. And this is as shown on a set of plans entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division Specific Repair Plan, 214 Market Street and Saybrook Street, uh, Brighton, two sheets dated January 5th, 2019. Good morning once again. Matthew Eckel with Jacob Simmons on behalf of 214 Market Street. Uh, this petition relates to the same development I just mentioned, uh, specifically along Market Street, there'd be 70 feet of uh, reconstruction of the existing sidewalk. We're proposing three new tree pits as well as two bike racks. Uh, along Saybrook Street, we're proposing to close the existing curb cut, which is about 10 and a half feet, and to create a new 20-foot curb cut to allow for vehicular access to the new development. We're also looking to uh, relocate the existing utility pole to accommodate that new curb cut. Any difference between these two, uh, between the larger set of plants and the ones that you had this morning? No. Okay. Just an easier way of... <laughs> Do we uh, receive a final sign-off from the CMP? I can't recall. Final sign-off from the CMP? I'm not sure. I don't want to answer one way or another without okay. knowing for sure. I, I know we were close. Yeah. I just want to know you would sign it. And is this large project or small project? This was small project. Is there a limit between the tree pit and the, and the sidewalk? I could use this. Uh, or is the, is the sidewalk, is the tree pit flush with the, the sidewalk? I believe it's flush because it is that five foot tree pit and then a five foot yeah. Yeah, access way. It should be. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. It, that. Uh, it looks like the floor is made a little less space, but it just might be the depth of the. Okay. I think so. Based on the dimensions, I believe it is flush. There you go. And sure it is. Thank you. Right. Other questions or comments? Name your Todd? Nope, we're good. Members of the public? All right. I'll entertain a motion on this side. I make a motion to approve a petition by 214 Market LLC <laughs> by making <laughs> specific repairs within the following public ways in Brighton, consisting of curb and sidewalk reconstruction, as well as new and relocated pedestrian ramps, three trees, bike racks, and railway curb cuts. All driven directed by chair and is shown on a set of plans entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division Specific Repair Plan. 214 Market Street and Saybrook Street, Brighton, two sheets dated January 5th, 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Moving on to our next item on a petition by uh, KYL 400 Belgrade LLC for the making of specific repairs within the following public ways in West Roxbury, consisting of curb realignment and sidewalk reconstruction, as well as new and relocated pedestrian ramps, street lights, street trees, landscaping, bike racks. Um, Okay. Uh, bike rack, storm drain infrastructure, and driveway curb cuts. The locations are Belgrade Avenue on its southerly and northeasterly sides at address number 400, 
generally between West Roxbury Parkway and Beach Street uh, slash Kenneth Street, and Beach Street on its northeasterly side, generally between West Roxbury Parkway and Belgrade Avenue slash Kenneth Street. This was new business on June 20th, 2019. And this is shown on a set of plans entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division Specific Repair Plan, 400 Belgrade Avenue and Beach Street, West Roxbury, three sheets in January 3rd, 2019. Morning. Good morning, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, Attorney John Pulgini. Uh, with me this morning is uh, Lucio Trimbuco, who is the architect on this project, together with John Doros, who is the owner of this uh, project. By way of history, just going back to our uh, previous presentation a couple weeks ago, uh, 400 Belgrade, this is, you're probably all familiar with this site. It's an old uh, gas station located at the intersection of Belgrade Ave in Beach Street in West Roxbury. The, the approved project from BPDA and ZBA was 18 two-bedroom, two-bath units with 33 parking spaces that will be uh, located below grade. Total square footage is 31,000, um, and then as such, it went through the Article 80 process. Uh, this also went to an extensive uh, community and regulatory process. Now that process, the following specific repairs, which are before you came about. Uh, it's the addition of new sidewalks and pedestrian ramps, changes to curb line to control traffic uh, flow, uh, close two existing curb cuts on Beach and Belgrade, and replace them with a new curb cut of 20 feet on Beach Street, which is, will be the access to the new garage, uh, moving a light pole to the entrance of the parking garage, adding tree pits throughout the project, uh, adding bike, ra bike racks in the front as well as in the garage and um, plants al planters along the uh, back of the sidewalk, traffic signals, uh, signs, stop and crosswalk signs. And um, since we met with you before, I, I've had some uh, discussions with Mr. Hesford um, uh, through email and, and as of you know, yesterday, I believe, or the day before yesterday, I had forwarded him some revised plans. I, I appreciate the fact that you were on vacation because I went to go see you and they said, he's away. I'm like, gosh, she emailed me last night. That was kind of above and beyond. I was glad to talk to you. Yes. Um, so the, yeah, so kind of a unique situation, Mr. Osgood. The, um, the crosswalk that you can see on the plan um, before you shows um, it's a ways down from the entrance from the to uh, the building yep. uh, on Kenneth Street. The reason being it went to a very... Uh, intensive community and political process in the sense that there's a disabled veteran who lives right there and to have the crosswalk go right there he has a, a handicapped space out in front of his house um, so we had to move it in a different direction and so we moved it for uh, two reasons one we also had the um, we built out the sidewalks on both sides so it would be a shorter distance of a crosswalk I think it would be 24 feet as opposed to 40 feet which would be the normal length and also to kind of create a pinch point because that's where the, the traffic was speeding through. Um, as I stated, uh, Mr. Hesford and I had been going back and forth, I think, as of yet I had sent him some additional plans. I would appreciate if we could reach an agreement today or not, we could hold the Mylars until we could finalize the changes that I had sent. No one hold up the project. This is a simple fix right. uh, and revision in the, uh, the, the uh, document, but uh, certainly won't, uh, you know, We'll have a vote go forward on this, but we can work together to get that uh, done. Uh, I think there's some options that we can work out. I mean, obviously, I think it'd be important to your future tenants that they have proper crossings. Correct. So, something that definitely can be worked out. We appreciate that. So, we're going to be looking at a way to get from the entrance up towards Center Street and yes. more direct. Yep. Great. Okay. Good. Other questions or comments on this specific repair plan? Amy or Todd? Nope. All right, members of the public? Right. I'll entertain a motion on this item, uh, again, contingent upon that uh, final review uh, by the Boston Transportation Department. I'll make a motion to approve the petition by KYL 400 Belgrade LLC for making specific repairs within the following public ways in West Roxbury, consisting of curb realignment and sidewalk reconstruction, as well as new and relocated pedestrian ramp street lights, landscaping, <coughs> bike racks. Storm drain infrastructure and driveway curb cuts. As right in the record by the chair, to show the set of plans entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division. Specific repair plan 400 Belgrade Avenue and Beach Street, West Rockbury, three sheets dated January 3rd, 2019, with a caveat that we uh, have future discussion on the walkway. Sure. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.
Moving on to new business, our first item is 115 Federal Street, Devonshire Street, Boston Proper, an earth retention license on a petition by MCAF Winthrop LLC. Sort of utility not is the utility notification on you guys or is there any coordination that we have to do around notifying utility companies? So they've notified the utility That's companies, and they enter Cobux, yeah, it's the um, it's they're going to coordinate as they discover as who they're well, yeah, they're not always with it. Yeah. Right. 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 Other questions or comments on this? So this this area here is um, what we closed down on Devonshire right now is part of the construction manner plan. Yes. So that, that's where we're showing the pad as, yeah. as we discussed. Right. Well, actually, it's a new area. Yeah. Right. How, how long do they anticipate the, uh, the crane to be there? Right. Two years. Two, Two years. years. Two years. Right. Mm -hmm. 24 months. Right. You're going to be requesting off hours permitting for the poor or anything like that? I'm sure during that period we will need off hour permits. We will definitely need probably additional road closures to install the crane. Uh, you probably want to have a meeting with myself and Sean uh, prior to that. Yeah. We'll work that out for you. Sure. A absolutely. Other questions or comments? Okay. Just on the uh, also um, the park that's adjacent. On is there something that you're planning on in that area right now? Stay tuned. Yeah, so we'll be, we are in the process of reviewing with the various community members and stakeholders uh, the plan for Winthrop Square Park, which will be completely uh, refurbished as part of the project. 
we've been working with Attorney Chong on getting the assignment um, because it's currently controlled by one winter. I will be back here, I would say, in the next three months to so review that plan. It's so controlled by one winter. Who owns it? The city of Boston owns right. it. Yeah. It's so it's just under an existing LMI that. that these guys are going to take over. Um, so and the party is happy to let so them. So it's a public works that owns Yes. It's part of the right. Yeah, it's yeah. like in the street, yeah. Other questions or comments? Uh, we just asked them to adjust their cut up death. We're six feet in the sidewalk and 10 feet in the road. Yeah. And that'll be on, I think that's on the plan. It's actually on the plan, yeah. We can have, have them deliver to you guys. Awesome. Members of the public? All right, see you guys in two weeks. Does that work? Okay. All right, until the 25th. All right, our next item of new business is 25 Amory Street, Brewery Lane, Alliance Way in Roxbury. Line and grade approval, layout approval on a set of joint petitions by Jackson Square Partners, LLC. 25 Amory, partner, uh, 25 Amory Apartments, LLC, 250 Center Street, Housing, LLC, 41 Amory, LLC, 75 Amory Apartments, LLC, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, and the Massachusetts Bay of Transportation. NTA Saza, Senior Project Manager with JPNDC. <coughs> Good morning, Tyrande Ellis, Director of Real Estate for JPNDC. <laughs> Lindsay Gale, Project Manager at the Community Builders. And I must say, we're very happy to be here. It's been a long process going back to, I think, 2006 when I first started working on the redevelopment of Jackson Square. Uh, and this is tonight, today is a summation of years of hard work and coordination between three nonprofits. Uh, Nick McLean at APNDC, Urban Engine and Community Builders, as well as uh, the involvement of the DHA, which we'll see in the next next uh, petition. A lot of coordination with the city, the Art of Lady process has been completed, and agencies and others, uh, as well as we relocated a 60 in sewer um, this past year in order to free up the site for, for affordable housing. Uh, I'll give you an overview of the two projects. There are actually two petitions, two different projects before you today. But we're bringing them together because they are dependent on each other, and there's a lot of the same players involved with both projects. This is the existing Camry Street. Um, that dead ends right here and comes out this way. Right now, this is a vacant parcel. Uh, this is the 125 Camry Street, which is the uh, senior housing, which is going through renovations. And then there's, uh, there's the uh, community building back here, and the rest of the essential parking lots. So the applications we'll see today is Brewery Lane, which will start at Amory Street here, which will be proposed in the public way. And that was after years of uh, conversations and discussions. And then we have Alliance Way that runs from Brewery Way to Lost Pathogen Street. So this will be a private way that provides a perpendicular parking. Within the 125 Amory Street parcel, we have Alliance Way that runs from Amory Ave to Atherton Street. Holloway Street, which runs from Henry Street to Alliance Way. Holton Street, which runs from Henry Street to Alliance Way. These are all private ways. And the final last, the final last is along Henry Street, specific repairs for sidewalk improvements. Um, it's pedestrian petitions that go with that. So speak specifically to Brewery, Brewery Lane, follow way from here to here. This is a Better. It's a 290 foot uh, long road, 58 foot right away. We're we'll proposing 10 foot concrete sidewalks on both sides with three bits of the street lighting. Uh, we have a uh, 38 feet wide travel, which allows for two way traffic, seven, seven foot parking, 24 feet of two way traffic, and seven foot parking lane. Alliance Way, that's right from the end of Brewery to Amory Ave. It's a 40 foot wide public way, private way, 350 feet long from here to here, 10 foot wide sidewalk on this side, um, an 8 foot parking lane along here, 22 foot travel lane for both directions of traffic, and then perpendicular parking along this area here. Um, I'm happy to go into greater detail if you'd like. Um, but that's essentially the Jackson Square petitions. 
um, the TAPA was submitted um, in April, which is in the BTV stands right now. Uh, we have uh, the CMP will be submitted once the contractor is selected. Our hopes is to start construction on this this fall. Uh, we have plans before Boston Water and Sewer for a final approval for a water main that is being installed in here as well as the street drainage within Brewery Lane. Uh, we have the site plan approval for 25 Henry Street. We don't think we have the funding for that. That work is to start this fall. The 250 Center Street is uh, seeking funding. We hope that can start in 2020. Uh, there is also the Henry Street extension and some works in Center Street that we'll be working with public works on in the coming months to finalize that design and be back with you. The alignment between the short section of Amory Street and Brewery Lane. Yeah, uh, no, sorry, not the, not the private way, but the, uh, on the right hand side, on the yeah. in Central Street side now, sorry. What about that? Where, the, where Amory Street breaks off of Columbus Ave. The, and then, yeah. exactly, and then the yeah. crossing, exactly. So, this, what does that intersection look like? How well is that actually going to be lined up with? the new private way that you're this, creating? Yeah, this shows the bump out here. There's only yeah. on one side. Uh, yeah. We've worked with public, we work with public works on it, with Amy's office on that line. So we feel good about that? It's, it's a square up. It's yeah. As square as it can be given it's 25. Square. It's square or right okay. ahead. It's square. And, we, <laughs> <laughs> and, you, okay. and, and one couldn't go further because of the existing building, that, that, that 25 Amory is at that corner. Yeah, we had, it's, okay. uh, we had here, and actually on this side, we're actually using our We've been working closely with the acquirer and uh, acquiring some of his land for this public way. Um, as well in the back, the brother is digging up some of his land for the private way. So there's been a lot of negotiations and coordination before we are today. And the crossing is sort of the, what is I guess, the, the, the top of your map, the west side, the angled crossing. Exactly. That will be to a path that you'll build that will go to the uh, Jackson Square Station. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. There, there, there's also hopes for funding for the other section. Construct this greenway and construct this path in plaza that will be directly adjusted. And that's coordination with DCR and the MBTA, presumably? Or yeah, that was the selected desire that's line, so totally. it's, yeah. well, that's where we put the grass pump. Okay. So that desire line, does that bring you to a signal for a crossing? Here, to here? No. This, uh, this is a signal line. And a signal line is located. This is a signal line. Is there, how many? Is there, there is a signal there. That's where the buses come out, but is there a crosswalk there today? Yeah. There is a crosswalk there? Okay. Because we want to place a desire line where we have traffic control. That's the driver of that crosswalk, is that that was the natural. Yeah. Guy, is this the uh, tap book that you uh, delivered, uh, sent over the other day? Uh, okay, so you have this tap for 250 and 25. budget negotiations as usual. Okay. So when do you expect to have them on board? I mean, I think we're within striking distance probably within the next couple weeks. Okay. We've got to get close. aware of the CMP requirement? Yes, yes. sir. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And we've been coordinating between the development partners, TCB, and yes. JPD. Anything you want to cover in this end? All right. Questions or comments? Yeah. Amy or Todd? Members of the public? Please. Not, not a member of the public, but here as counsel for the Boston Housing Authority, we're a co-petitioner for the 125 uh, Amory part of the project. And we just, uh, obviously, as a co-petitioner, we are in support of this project. And we appreciate the PIC's consideration. Thank you. Perfect. We'll see you in, oh, please go. I, I would just like to offer for the record that uh, Mark Boyle was here from mm -hmm. the MBTA. He had to leave, but um, yeah. certainly a co and has been supporting. very much. Terrific. He will be here in a couple weeks for the public hearing as well. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So we'll see you in two weeks on this item. And then our next item of new business uh, is 125 Amory Street, Alliance Way, Holzer Street, Holloway Street, Roxbury Land Approvals, Pedestrian Easement, Specific Repairs, on a set of joint petitions by Amory Street Partners, Boston Housing Authority, Amory Terrace Limited Partnership, and the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority.
Management of Engineering and whoever it is. Thank you, Gail, for coming to And Dean Pepper, the Mutual Council to the Boston Housing Authority. Sure, on the small urban edge. So this project is a little fresher than the one we've been working on since 2006. We've been working on this, I think, since 2015 or so. Uh, we were back, we were here last fall for some specific repair improvements in this area here. Part of the petition today is to continue this to different repairs to the sidewalk between within the area that is owned by BHA. We did this primarily because this had an early construction package for the renovated building and the same construction now. So what we will we'll do is we're starting here, we're going to connect uh, a line way here all the way to Matheson Street, and that's about an 810 foot run. Uh, the width is variable, it's about between 38 and 40 feet. Uh, on this side, on the southern side, we provide a 9 foot wide sidewalk, 5 feet of concrete, 4 feet of pervious pavers. We have a 7 foot parking lane here as well, and on the lower east side, we have perpendicular parking. We also have tabletops at these intersections and these intersections for practical common purposes. And actually, Guy and I were just talking moments ago, and we may want to consider something at this intersection too. Yep. Um, and I think we'll do that for the public hearing. Just because it is all a private way, we can keep it on a private way. But just to have this series of traffic coming will make it much better. It has the community, but also uh, deter people from using it in the country. Uh, this will have street trees, uh, street lighting uh, as well. Uh, Holloway Street starts from Emory Ave. Alliance Way, it's about 380 feet in length, 54 foot right away. We maintain a nine foot sidewalk on both sides, five feet of concrete, five feet of pervious pavers. Within the 35 foot travel way, we have um, way traffic, 21 feet wide, two seven foot parking lanes on each side. And we have a tabletop in this area as well for traffic on purposes. On Holster Street, it's 320 feet long, 53 foot right away. A nine foot sidewalk on both sides, five feet of concrete, four feet of pervious pavers, 34 feet of pavement, uh, so it's 727 one way traffic in this direction, which helps a lot, which aligns it with this way here. Now, and, and again, we have a tabletop for uh, traffic common purposes right here. And I know Ed will ask, and we'll make sure we get any construction documents. We will have signs that in case private ways, so we must get the phone call. <laughs> And I touched upon this already. What do you want to ask? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate it. Uh, on Amory Street here, as I mentioned before, we'll have uh, reconstructing the remaining sections of Amory Street that have not been approved by this commission yet, maintaining the same design components with an eight-foot wide concrete sidewalk, six-foot pervious pavers, new street lights, and with that, we'll be asking for a five hundred pedestrian to ensure that all the access is within a accessible public area. Uh, this is less about the design and more about uh, just bike parking. Given your proximity to the Southwest Corridor, I assume that's sort of a component of what's going to get built out sort of on site or part of the buildings. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, here we go. Oh, sorry. Guy Busa here, Harvard Sign Hudson. So we have the um, one to one requirement for, uh, for on site bike storage, and then we have additional um, bike racks around the site. I'm trying to Look up the number here, but we can get you that exact number next next time. It's included in the tab. I think. It's in the tab. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Right. I think uh, you're, go ahead. I just want to know for Boston Water and Sewers concerns. Uh, the 125 Army Street. We have site plan approval. We are working through final site plan approval for Building C. Um, and the construction. We hope to start on that. Funding comes through when we start that construction like this year. Um, these other remaining two, but this existing building here, these other two buildings um, depends on the funding terms available. Um, water and sewer and has reviewed the entire uh, schematic design of all this, but as we build out each piece, we are going to get the second under approval for that piece of the contract. Also, the Boston Fire Department is utilizing this space here for a temporary facility while their building gets renovated. And I understand they started setting up those operations and passing through. So we've been working closely with the fire department they have what they need, how we just going forward with our project. Thank you for your welcome. Members of the public? Okay. 
right. See you guys on the 25th. Does that work? All right. Thank you. Until then. Thank you. All right. Our final item of new business is 719 Tremont Street, Boston Proper, a grant of location on a petition by Crown Council Fiber. Just to see if there's any implications. I don't think there's. I guess it's important. Right. I just want to coordinate with them yeah. to make sure that we. I'm sorry. Who am I coordinating? Uh, the staff on the desk and the MBTD. Yeah. Okay. They, they've got a, there's a plan for Tremont Street. It's not a, about. It's just about pavement markings and at this point. But uh, okay. I just want to make sure that we're not. Uh, yep. The person is Charlotte Fleetwood. I'm Check. sorry. Charlotte Fleetwood. Charlotte Fleetwood. Okay. We'll get you the contact. Number. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Okay, no problem. Great. Other questions or comments? Yep. Anybody talk? Nope. Members of the public? All right, see you in, in uh, two weeks on the 25th. And I'll be first on the agenda. <laughs> you won't be last. <laughs> that I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved.